Welcome to this webinar where we are introducing version 1.1 of our guidelines for techno-economic assessments and life cycle assessments for CO2 utilization. My name is Volker Sick and I'm the director of the Global CO2 Initiative. It is known that carbon dioxide utilization can become a mainstream component among solutions for climate change mitigation. Substantial amounts of CO2 can be used as feedstock to produce products in potentially cleaner ways and to create entire new product categories as well. Several years ago, the initiative in identified the need to provide harmonized, ideally even standardized guidelines to enable and ensure consistent, comparable and transparent assessments of the environmental footprint and the economic opportunity of CO2 utilization technologies. We therefore assembled an international team to work on such guidelines, and we have published the first version in 2018. Since then, these guidelines have found widespread use, and we have continued expanding the work and have convened meetings and collected other feedback to now bring you version 1.1. Thank you for joining us today for this launch event that will take us about an hour and a half, including questions and answers and discussions with all of you. While we record the presentations by Arnold Zimmermann from TU Berlin and Tim Langhorst from RWTH Aachen and now ETH Zürich, uh, the Q&A components uh, will be removed from the recording. We will follow Chatham House rules. So please feel free to speak your mind. Questions can be submitted in writing at any time via the Q&A tool in Zoom, and attendees can upvote questions. So keep an eye on those questions. Grant Faber um, with the Global CO2 Initiative at the University of Michigan will moderate the Q&A sections and begin by asking those questions that the audience has ranked highest. After the end of each present of the presentations and addressing written questions, we will invite participants for oral questions and comments. I hope that this webinar will be useful to you. Again, thank you for being with us today and over to Arno. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, yeah, thank you for the opportunity um, to present this work here, Volker. Um, we're excited uh, to, that you join us today. Um, we got a couple of points prepared for you. So first, we would like to talk about how this update worked, um, how we prepared this update, and then run you through the individual parts of the book. So that means part A, general assessment principles, part B, TEA guidelines, that'll be done by me, and then Part C, LCA guidelines, and the outlook will be presented by Tim Langhorst. Uh, after each part, we have the opportunity to ask some clarifying questions. And then in the, after the presentation, we have time for discussion. Now let's start with the uh, road to version 1.1. As you probably know, climate change means a rise of global temperature. And the goal of the Paris Agreement is to limit this temperature rise to well below two degrees Celsius. Various technology pathways can lead to this goal and many are under development. Some development projects fail to deliver results, others succeed. In technology development, each stage requires more and more resources. Now, where to set priorities in technology development and how should funding be allocated? Change or failure at early stages is cheap, but at late, late stages is costly. So instead of pursuing a technology that is not promising, it's better to say fail early and cheap and use resources for more promising technologies. And there technology assessment can provide insights identifying these promising technologies. And we need to focus research efforts on technology pathways that show this reduced environmental impact, but not only that, also increased value. Now, one field of technologies to reach the two degree target is carbon capture and utilization. CCU. On the right, you can see products that we consume every day. The consumption and production of these products, however, creates emissions, especially CO2 emissions. 
to close the cycle, CO2 emissions or CO2 from air can be captured and then reused to produce products. These CO2-based products can be chemicals, materials, or fuels, for example, methanol. Let's have a look on the assessment of CCU methanol. A review on techno-economic TEA studies was recently compiled by Chen Tiet al. The authors show that existing TEA studies on methanol production via hydrogenation largely vary in their resulting cost. So here you can see the methanol cost on the one hand side and the year of the study on the other side. And you can see a large spread in the results by larger than uh, one order of magnitude. A review on life cycle assessment, LCA studies, was conducted by Arts et al. The authors show that LCA studies also largely vary in their results, and in this case, global warming potential. So here you see the global warming potential on the y-axis and on the x-axis is the, um, the study count. Again, the results vary larger than one order of magnitude. So these varying results send mixed signals to decision makers in government, business, and civil society alike. And we need to harmonize technology assessment approaches for CCU, so the variety in results can be decreased and decision making improved. To harmonize these assessment approaches, as Falk already mentioned, the Global CO2 Initiative and EIT Climate Hig organized the consortium to help create a first version of assessment guidelines. This consortium consists of RWTH Aachen University, the University of Sheffield, IASS Potsdam, and TU Berlin. We together started with a comprehensive literature review followed by an expert consultation workshop to create a first draft. We then conducted an in-depth review workshop, revised the draft, and had it reviewed again. And overall, more than 50 global experts were involved in the workshops and reviews and in draft creation. The TEA and LCA guidelines for CO2 utilization were then published in fall 2018. This is what we call version one or 1.0. Um, the consistent project, however, doesn't stop there. It um, overall has three different target audiences or communities. Practitioners, so TEA and LCA practitioners, decision makers and commissioners, and the broader scientific community. So the guidelines are largely addressed to practitioners, people who are running these studies and organizing the studies. We held then, in addition, a series of workshops for decision makers and practitioners. And the results of these workshops were summarized in reports and helped to improve the guidelines. Based on the guidelines and feedback of these workshops, we produced a so-called making sense of TEA and LCA report that you might have read that's more targeted towards decision makers and commissioners. Then the guideline 1.0 and the workshop results also were published as peer reviewed articles for the broader scientific community. And last but not least, we published a set of worked examples elaborating on various aspects of the guideline for all communities to make them more present. However, we didn't want to stop there, but we wanted to improve and refine the guidelines version 1.0 um, for you. So we used an online survey and two workshops to collect feedback and guidance from many of you. Furthermore, we included a peer group on harmonization of TEA and LCA assessment that has uh, provided discussion and insights. And this all led to the publication of version 1.1. And in pictures, it looks like this. So first we had in-person workshops and later online workshops like the one today. However, um, these turned out to be quite uh, constructive and helpful. And everybody who participated, uh, small or large, we would really like to thank you for your inputs. And you can also be proud of yourself that uh, this all together led to this guideline and all these documents we created. And today we'd like to celebrate with you and introduce you the version 1.1. So you might ask yourself, what's new in version 1.1? Based on your input, we have raised and updated the draft, including recently published literature, better alignment of TEA with LCA, restructured and rephrased section to be more reader friendly. So in many, many parts we have revised and, and rephrased it. And then also we revised and expanded the guidelines that we now call provisions, so the individual sentences to be more instructive. Um, however, the version 1.1 is not a completely new document. It's a new edition, it's an update. And that's why we call it version 1.1, the launch of version 
1.0 was already two years ago. And this is uh, this way the webinar will now cover the guidelines as a whole on an updated level. So everybody who is familiar with version 1.0 already, um, we will highlight updates that we have done. And for everybody else, um, welcome and uh, enjoy. We will reintroduce the whole document to you. Um, for everybody who is already familiar, you might remember these uh, tables. Uh, each chapter in the guideline uh, concludes with the provision tables. These provisions have three levels, shall, should, and may. Shall provisions are the minimum requirements for achieving a standardized DEA LCA. Should, revision, should provisions cover a recommended level of analysis and produce a DEA LCA of greater depth? And may provisions produce the most detailed DEA LCA? Overall, the guideline is structured into three parts. First, part A, general assessment principles that covers aspects that are relevant for both TEA and LCA. And then we have the two individual parts, TEA guidelines and LCA guidelines. And we will discuss each part separately in the next slide. Now I'd like to come to part A directly and I'd like to show you two highlights there. Um, the first one is technology maturity. Um, the guidelines cover recommendations for all phases. Uh, so from low maturity research to high maturity development and deployment. We have included guidance on how to apply the so-called technology readiness levels, TRL, for um, these assessments, reaching from the very first stage idea to the very last stage continuous operation. Um, in various sections of the guidelines, you can find recommendations for these specific maturity levels, or sometimes for the stages, research, development, and deployment. Um, we have extended the guidelines here and added a section on screening assessment as well, so on the version 1.1, meaning how to conduct assessment on a low level of detail. And this is ongoing research, um, the screening part, and Tim will mention something about this in the Outlook. The second topic I'd like to uh, highlight to you in part A is uh, the integration of TA and LCA. We have identified, so this is also extended by the way, um, we have reworked this part and this is also ongoing research. Um, we have identified three parts. The first type, or first, sorry, we have identified three types and the first type is called qualitative discussion-based integration. And there we have uh, the system boundaries can differ between the two studies, uh, between TA and LCA. And we recommend a qualitative discussion of hotspots. So qualitatively discuss whether the hotspot in TEA is and where the hotspot in LCA is and how they relate. The second type we can uh, we call the combined indicator-based integration. <clears throat> and there, the system boundaries of the studies need to be aligned. So that means that they look at the same aspect. I'll introduce system boundaries uh, in just a minute. Um, so when these are aligned, we can include not only the typical TEA and LCA indicators separately, but also uh, co uh, com combine them and calculate quantitative indicators to touch upon both economic and environmental criteria. So we call them combined indicators. And the third type we call preference-based integration. And this type is similar to the second type, except it also includes preferences of decision makers. And a typical tool is uh, multi-criteria analysis. Um, as I said, this is uh, ongoing research and Tim will uh, say something about how you can get involved and, and what to expect in the version 2.0 where we want to extend this integration part. Great, and I'll just continue with uh, part B. Um, so now we are diving into the techno-economics, uh, meaning that we largely look on technical and especially economic criteria. Um, so one of the major adaptions we made to techno-economic assessment was to adapt it to the existing four phases of LCA. Uh, the first phase is called goal and scope definition. And goal and scope definition provides guidance for the overall study. It defines what aspects are included and what systems we compare to. The second phase is called inventory analysis. In inventory analysis, we collect, sort, and document relevant data we need for the assessment. The third phase is calculation of indicators, where we produce the results. The fourth phase is interpretation, where we evaluate consistency and robustness of outcomes of other phases. And interpretation occurs in parallel to all other phases and helps us to improve the study. Many times, 
we have to go back to a prior phase and revise it, leading to the improvement loops in the assessment. And you can see the, the arrows bouncing back and forth. Um, the fifth phase we added secretly, and it's different to LCA, at least to the LCA ISO, um, is the reporting phase to highlight uh, the importance of reporting and addressing audiences. Um, by using the phases of LCA overall, we can build upon the methodological foundations of LCA and make TEA more systematic and transparent. And furthermore, using LCA phases, we can also enable easier alignment of TEA and LCA. And in the following, I'd like to go over each of these phases uh, separately and uh, take out a few highlights of each chapter. Starting with goal and scope, of course. Um, so the first step in goal and scope is defining the goal. The goal is decisive for all phases and it guides the overall assessment, but also uh, the scope definition. In the guidelines, we have included principles of goal definition, perspectives of goal definition, and defining assessment scenarios and some thoughts on that. And here I'd like to speak about the perspectives um, following the ILCD handbook, which is a um, yeah, an LCA handbook. We looked at the three perspectives for goal definition. There's the first um, one called R&D perspective, research and development perspective that looks at specific processes or projects and is common in early phase uh, projects, especially for um, scientific and academic communities, but also for R&D uh, departments in uh, industry. The corporate perspective focuses on the industrial side. So on the larger side, compares different uh, investment alternatives, um, especially between ben two benchmark technologies. And then we have a third one called market perspective that takes a more holistic view, for example, on the effects of policy or on the whole value chain. And depending on what perspective you take, your goal might dramatically change. And it also means that your study will be uh, very different to what you want to look at. Either you look at a specific process or you look at an overall supply chain. You might want to have more detail in the one and then much less detail in the other one, but you want to spread out much further. Um, after you've defined your goal, you can move on to define the scope. And in the scope, uh, you say basically the what and how. So what aspects do need to be assessed and how should they be assessed? And um, the guideline there includes sections on how to define the product application, a functional unit. So we took over this concept of functional unit from TEA, sorry, from LCA uh, to TEA. Um, then also system elements and system boundaries and assessment indicators. Let's have a look on more detail uh, on system boundaries. So the classic product life cycle that I have borrowed this graph uh, from our colleagues in Aachen, um, it, it spans from resource extraction, also called uh, cradle, to production, and the company gates, and then transport, use, recycling, and disposal, also called grave. And TEAs, especially in the R&D and corporate perspectives, typically focus on the production side. So that means between the company gates or gate to gate. Um, preliminary LCAs are similar. They also cover cradle to gate. And then we can take the overall market perspective TEAs or whenever the phases following the production are different, and we need to cover the whole, uh, the whole uh, life cycle, meaning cradle to grave. Note that recycling loops are covered in this approach, and based on this approach, we can define um, product systems. Uh, for example, in a scheme like this, so there we have um, flows across into the product system, we call an input flow, then we have the different um, steps in the product system we call a system element so defining your, the granularity of your assessment um, here very important system boundary so what what is included in the assessment and what's not included and then uh, flows leaving uh, the assessment uh, scope is in this case the output flow and if we draw one for like this for the product system and one for the benchmark system we can then compare and say what is included what is excluded is this um, comparison a fair comparison Great, once we have done this, so we've defined our goal and scope, um, we can move on creating and analyzing our inventory, meaning our data. Inventory analysis is about collecting, checking, and documenting the right data. The guidelines include sections on interim data quality control, collecting data, 
deriving uh, CO2 price, deriving prices for other inputs and documentation. So as you can see, it's heavily focused on prices and economics, but um, more or less it gives you best practices for also collecting technical. Speaking of how to collect, we have this five-step approach um, on building an inventory. So first we need to define and check quality requirements. Second, we need to identify which processes or which system elements and sub-processes uh, we have in our assessment. Third, we collect technical data. Fourth, we then also collect the economic data. And lastly, we document this data. Um, the guidelines here include aspects on CO2. So that means sources, where does the CO2 come from? And also the costs associated with it, but also uh, costs and sources of electricity, hydrogen, mineral sources, et cetera, et cetera which are typical uh, um, best practices uh, we found in other studies and things that experts have recommended to us. Um, now I'd like to come to something that we, is new in version 1.1, a general um, flow sheet or a flow chart on how to derive a flow price in general. So before we had these guidance or these provisions in the separate chapters, and now we have combined this together in one flow sheet to make it more uh, to make it more clear and to have easier provisions on that. Um, so basically follow three principles. First, uh, we need to check the technical specifications. So the first question we have to ask is, uh, does the flow that we want to look at and the price we want to find for this flow, does the flow technically uh, fulfill the specifications? If it does not uh, fulfill the specifications, we have to do something about uh, this flow. So either change the source, the production technology, et cetera, uh, until it um, matches the specifications. The second principle is the system boundary. Um, there's the question, is uh, source production handling included or not included in the system boundary? So if it's not included, we have an input flow. So you remember it crosses the system boundary. Um, if handling only is included, a somewhat in intermediate state, um, where we can still say an input flow, but we might have to correct the price by a few factors. And then, um, sorry, we have a, a source that is not crossing the boundaries, but we might want to still find out the price. For example, if I have a CO2 capture inside my assessment and I want to still know what's the, capture, what's the cost of capture of CO2, um, that's still relevant, um, but I will derive this price differently. And then the third question is the location of this flow. So is a specific location defined yes or no and depending on the, asking these questions for example if you run down here this section you have an input flow um, location is defined we would then recommend to use an input sales price from the market and specific storage and transport costs okay uh, that's uh, as much on an inventory once we have all the inventory there and the relevant data available we can now move on to calculation of our indicators and the guideline covers three parts. First, general indicators, so any indicators that you might want to calculate. Then we have a special emphasis on some economic indicators. Um, and then we have another chapter on weighting and normalization, which is often done, but we see it rather optional, but we want to uh, provide the best practices there as well. Um, economic indicators we look at is um, the common ones, which are capital expenditure, KFX, operating expenditure, OPEX. Then the other expenditures that we here call general expenditure, Gen X. And then of course our profitability indicators, which can be um, the net present value, et cetera. So in the TA guidelines, we discuss various methods uh, for estimating this, uh, these, these indicators and calculating these indicators. And we cluster them by maturity, so by research, development, and deployment. Um, and these are some of the, the methods and the types, but what I want to make sure is just keep in mind that these methods that you apply need to comply with your goal and scope. So do they serve your idea? And then also they need to apply or comply with your technology maturity and the data that you have available. Um, seems like an obvious choice, but sometimes um, you can, or sometimes it's done that you provide, a, employ a very fancy method, very data intensive method, but the data is not actually really available. And there are a lot of assumptions being done. So you increase your uncertainty unnecessarily. Um, speaking of uncertainty, um, in the beginning, in the research stage, we have a lot of uncertainty input data normally, so we have to make a lot of assumptions uh, often, 
and that we have a lot of uncertainty, which is decreasing over time, of course, because we have more and more specific idea of what the research project is actually about. And on the other hand, of course, we get more and more data available. So in the end, in, uh, so we have to choose in the beginning a simpler method, um, but also have to accept that we will have higher uncertainty in our results. And in the deployment stage, we can choose much more sophisticated methods, but we also um, need to achieve a lower uncertainty in results. So coming to the interpretation phase, um, the interpretation phase is the phase that checks the results of uh, the other phases in terms of consistency, completeness, reliability. Um, for example, here we check whether the scope that you have defined or the data in your inventory actually lets you answer these questions that you have postulated in your goal of your study. And once you have the results of your indicators, you can go ahead with specific interpretation methods um, and here the guideline cover uncertainty analysis, sensitivity analysis, interpreting individual indicators, and multi-criteria decision analysis. Let's have a further look on uncertainty and sensitivity analysis and their purpose. Uncertainty analysis tells you how certain your result is, and sensitivity analysis tells you how assumptions and par parameters influence these results. In the TEA guidelines, we discuss various methods regarding to the maturity, but again, keep in mind that overall methods need to comply with um, technology maturity and data availability, goal and scope, and also the nature of data. But why are we applying, uh, applying these uncertainty and sensitivity analysis? Well, the overall goal is to increase reliability and credibility and robustness, uh, robustness of the assessment. So commonly, we recommend to start with available data and quick estimates, and then improve data step-by-step step where it turns out to be a priority. So we call this an, the iterative approach. And um, so if a certain parameter shows a high uncertainty, so it's here on this axis, and at the same time a high sensitivity, so meaning that the result is very sensitive to a change in this parameter, um, we have a high uh, priority for data improvement. In contrast, you don't need to spend a lot of time on effort uh, improving data that is much more certain and low in sensitivity. So once you have your results from the calculation phase and also the conclusions and limitations from the interpretation phase, you can move on to the reporting phase. And the big question there is how to tailor the message to the audience. In the DEA guidelines, we cover addressing different audiences, reporting at different maturities, some aspects on executive summaries and include templates and checklists for reporting. For reporting, we can come back to the perspectives that we have used in the goal definition. So your R&D perspective audience consists mostly of R&D experts and funding agencies. And the R&D audience demands detailed technical information, aspects on economics or social implications, however, can be added, but usually at a lower level of detail. Your corporate perspective audience consists most likely of investors and corporate decision makers. And the corporate audience demands both technical and economic reporting and a reporting at two different levels, as you probably already come across this. So they want a full report, but also a summary called sometimes the executive summary. And then um, your market perspective audience consists most likely of policy related audiences, and the market audience is interested and the larger societal implications and demands also to include environmental criteria and, and mixing much more criteria into the assessment, um, which makes these assessments sometimes very hard to do, but very relevant for deciding um, societal impacts and what technology to fund, for example, or to politically support. Um, for your convenience, we have added a checklist for reporting um, and also a summary table that allows experienced readers to quickly grasp the essence of your assessment. Yeah, hello. Um, and uh, I hope you see the screen as it is. Um, thank you, Arno, for the introduction and the presentation of the TA guidelines. This helps a lot for me because I do not have to explain everything from the ground again. And uh, TA harmonization was a huge task and now allows for comparison of economics. In addition to this, we need to assess for the environmental impacts of CCO technologies as well. So uh, for this purpose, life cycle assessment 
is a sound and well-established tool uh, to assess for the whole life cycle of the product from cradle to grave. LCA accounts for a huge range of different environmental impacts, uh, from global warming impact over use of resources and land, to toxicity, to mention just a few. Um, LCA is well established and standardized by the ISO norms 14040 and 14044. However, uh, the ISO norms leave, leave open substantial choices as they cover all kinds of products and services and not only CCU. Um, these choices lead to incomparable studies as uh, Arno already explained. And uh, here you see the results of different studies uh, on CO2-based methanol production. They are ranked after their calculated global warming impact. Each bar you see here represents the result of one LCA study. Each color represents one technology. What decisions can we derive from this figure? Uh, unfortunately, not a single one. Uh, those studies assessing the same technology, um, shown in the same colors, for example, blue, um, come to completely different results. And this is not because they violate the ISO standards. Every study uh, you see here is conformed to the ISO standards, and every decision is certainly well considered and made for good reasons. However, in the end, the different decisions, for example, in modeling, um, in background data, or other choices, uh, lead to huge deviations. That is why results are no longer comparable, and we cannot use them for making decisions like which technology to choose, um, what we were aiming for. So there's a strong need for a harmonized LCA approach for CCU. Uh, we worked on a harmonized LCA approach uh, and did this in two steps. Um, both were accompanied by the expert workshops um, and many of you participated there. Thanks for this. Uh, first, we identified any restricted um, uh, or identified and we restricted the methodological choices in LCA. Um, that are now left open in the ISO standards and we made it more specific to CCU. Afterwards, we gave advice on harmonization in order to reduce uh, the deviating results. This brought us to version 1. Uh, but what about version 1.1? As Arno explained, we integrated your feedback and we also included learnings from the paper um, that was peer-reviewed and the whole process uh, of the peer review. Um, and today I'd like to highlight some of those changes and I will try to recap uh, what issues we already solved in version one for those who are new to the guidelines. The presentation will follow the same structure as the TA um, presentation and as our document. And our document um, structure follows the ISO standards and the, IL, um, and the ILSD um, handbook. Uh, each phase is described in one chapter here and as our guidelines aim for supporting those who are new to the LCA, each chapter starts with a short introduction. After this, you'll find CCU-specific guidance uh, in line with the ISO standard for each phase. And today, uh, we will go through these phases, which Arno already introduced, and I'd like to give you a glance on the aspects covered in this document. Uh, this won't be a full summary of the LCA guidelines, and I try to focus on those issues that are mainly responsible for the incomparable uh, results we saw before. In addition, I will highlight some changes in version 1.1 for those who are already familiar with our document. Uh, the first phase is the goal and scope definition. What are the major issues here? Um, functional unit first and system boundaries. And both of them depend on the product and its intended application. Though I will explain them for example um, of the CO2 based methanol uh, that we mentioned already. So the CO2 based methanol can have three different kinds of application, a chemical intermediate, a fuel or use as an energy storage. For a chemical intermediate, the reference product shall be, for example, fossil-based or bio-based methanol. While for fuel, there is no need 
uh, to use the exact same molecule, but a currently established fuel like gasoline. For use as energy storage, methanol shall be compared to existing uh, storage solutions, um, for example, batteries. But how can we now find the right system boundaries and functional units? To answer this, we will have a closer look on the use of a chemical intermediate. Um, many CCU products aim to compete with already existing products. In order to compare them uh, with a fossil benchmark, uh, we should have a look at each of those stages um, we listed here. And we will now compare impacts of the CO2-based methanol and the fossil-based uh, methanol for each of those stages to find out how, out how to select uh, the system boundaries. So for the first life cycle stages, uh, the processes and the re uh, related impacts differ. After the final product is achieved, C2-based methanol and fossil-based methanol are exactly identical. Therefore, the impacts of distribution, utilization, and end of life are considered identical as well. For this reason, a cradle-to-gate approach is sufficient here. As both products are now methanol of the same quality, the environmental impacts can be compared with one kilogram methanol as functional unit. Uh, please note here that this is only valid uh, if no large structural changes will appear um, because of the use of methanol um, in the new way of production. Um, now uh, we can select a functional unit or a system boundary for comparison of two chemical identical uh, intermediates. But what if a product should be compared to a different kind of product? Um, here we can have a look on the fuel and uh, comparing a CO2-based methanol as fuel, we compare it with gasoline as today's marginal fuel product. Methanol and gasoline differ not only in their production, but also in combustion properties as they are chemical different products. In this case, we have to account for the whole life cycle from cradle to grave. And the product shall be compared based on their fulfilled function. For example, for each mile driven. Um, we expanded those ideas for the methanol example and developed a decision tree for all kinds of CCU products. Uh, now we can use the decision tree to select the functional unit and the system boundaries that are relevant for CCU. And we revised this in version 1.1 and now combined all decision trees to a single one. And this new decision tree is based on only three questions. Uh, with the first two questions, you can already lead uh, or under the right system boundaries. And um, to answer which is the best uh, uh, functional unit to choose, you have this uh, third question as well. And what else did we um, change for the goal and scope chapter? Um, in vision, version 1.1, we clarified that further functional units, like, uh, like uh, the use of energy, may be applied if they are reasoned by the goal of the study. Uh, let's now leave the goal and scope phase and talk about uh, the main issue for the inventory phase. The main issue for, the, uh, for CCU is uh, the background data for the feedstocks. Um, for sure, uh, background data is always a, a huge issue in, and important for any LCA. However, for CCU, um, they are even more important. A huge amount of energy is needed to activate the low energy molecule CO2. And for CCU, often hydrogen is used uh, as its a high energy reaction partner. However, hydrogen can be produced in different ways, as you see here. Not only the production process itself is relevant, um, the supply of energy uh, plays an important role too. Though you might ask what data to choose, and there's an easy answer, all. But why? Uh, we calculated three options, and um, oh, the three options you see here, and I'll show you the results. Um, the global warming impacts of the hydrogen supply processes 
strongly deviate. You might already get that this, this is one of the main reasons for the different results of the Nepno studies. And therefore, we request the practitioners to assume different scenarios. Uh, we revised those scenarios in version 1.1 and corrected smaller mistakes and added more impact assessment methods. Uh, for your convenience, this is now available as an Excel sheet. At the end of my presentation, I will show you the results of applying uh, two types of scenarios for our methanol case as well. Uh, but before that, I'd like to give you a quick impression on the other chapters and highlight some more updates on version 1.1. Um, for the impact assessment phase, the main issue is the choice of LCIA methods. Um, though we define default methods uh, with respect uh, to the regional differences. In version 1.1, uh, we updated the methods um, that are used for US and the Euro uh, and for European Union. Um, this is what many of you requested. And uh, now we recommend, uh, we recommend to always use the most up-to-date version. Um, as today, uh, this is um, Tracy uh, 2.1 for the US and for uh, Europe, it's the environmental footprint in its third version. Uh, as our colleagues suggested in another report on LCA for CCU, we added the request to consider not only global warming potential for 100 years, uh, but for 20 years as well. And the next phase is interpretation. Um, here you might ask, is my technology carbon neutral or even carbon negative? And this question is very important for CCU processes um, as they all use CO2 as input. And in order to address this, we clarified uh, under which circumstances carbon neutral or even carbon negative emissions are possible for CCU. In version 1.1, uh, you'll find two smaller changes here. Uh, the first, we changed the term carbon reducing to the more precise greenhouse gas emission reducing. And uh, we also added a clarification in this chapter. Um, because carbon neutrality or even negativity can only be claimed if assessment is covering the whole life cycle from cradle to grave. This is what we added here as well. Uh, and last but not least, the chapter about reporting. And here um, we did quite the same as for the TA part and provide checklists and table for transport uh, reporting here. Uh, now we finished our uh, quick walk through all of our um, the chapters of the LCA guideline. However, I promised you to, um, to show you the methanol example once again, and here you are. Uh, you already know this slide, uh, but now we apply our guideline to, um, to this uh, survey and uh, we use, for this case, two different scenarios. First, the scenario with low decarbonization, and then um, full decarbonized scenario for for both heat and energy. Uh, let's start with the first, with the uh, uh, 2030 grid mix. And here you see the results um, for this low decarbonization scenario. Um, first, and most importantly here, um, you see that the deviation of results for identical technologies um, is now reduced. Now bars of the same color are nearly of the same size as it should be. Um, that's great, uh, because this shows that comparison of um, different technologies now is possible. And what else can we now learn from these results? Uh, we learned that producing methanol in a low decarbonized society has still higher impact than the conventional processes, uh, which you see here as a gray line. Though it might not be good um, to use uh, CCU in those scenarios from a climate perspective. Um, next, we can model a full decarbonized scenario. In a full decarbonized scenario, you see once again that the same technologies have comparable global warming impact. 
And here we used uh, CO2 from air capture. Under these assumptions, we see that all technologies may offer benefits compared to conventional process. Uh, please note that these results do not indicate carbon negative results. Um, because uh, here we calculated only from cradle to gate, and therefore um, the combustion is still missing here. So all in all, you can see that by applying our guidelines, harmonization and decision-making is possible now. So um, here, uh, to go back to the outlook, um, uh, I'd like to sum up what we um, presented and did right now. Um, now we can say that harmonization of TA and LCA is possible. And now TA fits to the standardized framework of LCA. Um, however, um, there's more to do because uh, we received a lot of feedback and requests and um, this envisioned us to go even further. And I already showed you the very first slide uh, that Arno presented today. Um, and there we, we showed the greater vision uh, to support decision making for technology development of the uh, to reach the two degrees goal. And uh, in general, our guidelines uh, that we present today uh, can uh, also be applied for this purpose. However, there are some challenges that uh, still remain, and we'd like to contribute to those um, challenges um, via providing additional guidance based on the expertise um, of the whole TA and LCA community and the CCU community. And um, for this purpose, we started uh, the consistent project in 2019, and we were aiming for, we still aim for um, further improvement in alignment. And um, here, Volker already mentioned that we are working together with uh, experts and organizations uh, and different research groups, uh, mostly from the North American area. And we further discuss open issues, um, for example, on the, the choice of the best available technologies. But I'd also like to invite all of you to join those um, discussions because uh, we, we'd like to have the whole community on board here. So please contact us in this. And the next point is, um, the engagement of the assessment community in CCU. And this is only possible because of um, all of you uh, taking part at our presentations and our workshops, uh, for example, today. Thank you on this. And uh, based on this and based on your feedback and best practices, uh, we want to expand the guidelines. Um, and we all already did an update here. Uh, as we presented today. However, as I said, we could not yet in include all of your requests, but we clustered them in, uh, in three main topics. The first is um, a guideline for integrated assessment, uh, which should combine TA and LCA provisions, as wished by uh, many of you, for, um, in particular from decision makers. And um, here we will focus on the three types of integrated assessment that Arno already explained shortly at the beginning of his talk. Uh, the second uh, um, aim is that we, we, want to, we want further guidance on how to assess technologies in the early stages of development. And here we will focus on screening, estimation methods, and on recommendations for early um, TRL or for each uh, technology readiness level. And uh, last but not least, uh, we also want to support decision makers and commissioners. And as already mentioned, um, here we have always uh, already published a Making Sense report um, as a separate document that you can also download freely. And all of these um, main topics will feed into our version two, um, and this will be presented in 2022. And for all steps um, on this way, I would like to invite all of you to contribute. And let me shortly explain how you can contribute from, from our perspective. Maybe you have even more ideas. 
Um, you can first uh, of all contact us uh, via email, for sure. And um, we are also part of the Global uh, CO2 Initiative Slack channel, which Volker will um, explain to you in a minute. Another way to participate are online surveys um, from our group or from the, from the Global CO2 Initiative, uh, like the questionnaire um, that we already mentioned today and that uh, Volker will introduce to you as well. Or as Volker already mentioned, uh, in May last uh, next year, there will also be um, hopefully in-person workshop in an other. Let's see, maybe it's still online or uh, we find a combined approach. Let's see. And um, this will focus on integrated assessment and on early stage assessments. So talking about contribution, once again, thank to all of you and hand over back to Volker. We we have we have seen and heard a lot of updates, a lot of material, and I, I really appreciate that almost everybody who uh, dialed in at the beginning is still with us. So that is fantastic. And of course, I I'm mostly uh, grateful for Arno, Tim, and you, Grant, um, for for taking the active part in today's webinar. But I also would be remiss if I wouldn't give a big shout out to the entire PEA and LCA team at TU Berlin, uh, RWTH Aachen, uh, and ETH Zürich, IASS Potsdam, uh, the University of Sheffield, and uh, the University of Michigan. I certainly also do want to re-emphasize our continuing work with NETL, NREL, ANL, Argo National Lab, and NRC Canada to further harmonize this work. This has come up a couple of times, but I, I really, in, in the context of some of the questions, want to especially emphasize and um, express my excitement to announce that uh, this, uh, this uh, harmonization group has charged us at the Global CO2 Initiative to create and maintain a one-stop access point for uh, TEA and LCA for CCUS. So stay tuned, uh, we begin to work on this very shortly. And by the time of our next TEA LCA workshop in the spring of 2021, um, this resource will be available um, to everyone. So, so there are various ways, uh, as, as Tim said, that how you can engage with us. Uh, we very strongly recommend uh, for an interactive um, dialogue with us to sign up for the uh, Slack channel. Um, and, uh, and of course, uh, it wouldn't be a good webinar if we wouldn't send you a survey afterwards. Uh, there's a lot of inputs that we want from you, technical inputs, et cetera, not just did you like the webinar, et cetera. Um, those two links, um, you can either uh, follow the QR codes right now, if that's convenient, but you will definitely receive both of those and email uh, contact information in the next few days, along with a link to the video recording, the edited video recording without the questions. Um, so stay tuned. We will send that to you uh, in a few days. Thank you so much.